Are we on the brink of another world war, World War III? It appears that the Middle East is sitting on a powder keg ready to be exploded at any given moment. Well, I know this much, that God's in control, and I know that He's on His throne, and I'm so glad you joined us to, until that day. It's going to be an absolute interesting study tonight, so grab your pencil and pen and your Bible. Do you know what the word Tish Ba'av means? Have you ever studied that word? Where does that fit in regards to Israel's past, Israel's present, and maybe even Israel's future? Could it be that Iran is going to attack Israel, an all-out attack on Tish B'Av, which is coming up here shortly. I'll tell you about it. But as we get in our study, I want to uh, indicate that uh, we are on the edge of Armageddon. You can almost hear the hoofbeats of the four horsemen of the apocalypse racing toward that climatic scene. Namely, where the blood is said to flow at the height of the horse's bridle some 200 miles long. The battle of all battles, Armageddon. But there are several events that lead up to that battle of all battles, Armageddon. And so let's talk about it as we look at this subject, Tish Ba'av. What does this mean? Where does this come from? How does archaeology cooperate with Israel's past and Israel's future. Let's get in our study. As we look at this subject, you'll notice on the screen is what is depicted as what is called the Ark of Titus. Have you ever heard of that term? It's a renowned archaeological site found in Rome. I had the privilege of going to this archaeological site and uh, and by the way, it may look like it's a small place, but it's a huge ark. And it was built, I think, in 81 A.D. And it shows these carrying away from the temple gold, 50 tons, I was told, of gold from the temple in the year 70 A.D. And many believe that this amphitheater, we see it right in the background. I've got this picture because I wanted you to see this ark, this archaeological renowned site, Ark of Titus, which corroborates with the Holy Scripture, shows taking the menorah and other utensils, as I mentioned, inside the temple when Rome stormed in and burned the temple in 70 A.D. The temple, of course, is where I'm standing behind me there is a picture I took just a few years ago. You can see the barely the gold dome of the rock. There's not a temple standing there now. But the significance of this term, Tish Ba'av, I want to draw your attention to a couple of passages of Scripture, and we're going to get right into our study. 2 Chronicles chapter 36 and then also Matthew 24. The first event that took place on Tish Ba'av is this event where the Babylonians in 586 stormed into Jerusalem and overthrew Jerusalem and the Temple Mount, taking the gold just like the Romans did years later. They, however, they took it back to Babylon. And as you know, 605 B.C. when Nebuchadnezzar invaded the southern kingdom. I want to share with you this passage in 2 Chronicles 36. I'll also read a, a supplementary text. Verse 7 of chapter 36 says, Nebuchadnezzar also carried, he was the king now, during the days of Daniel, he carried the vessels of the house of the Lord to Babylon and put them in his temple at Babylon. Skipping over to verse 18. And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king and of his princes, all these he brought to Babylon. And 
All of this was done to fulfill the word of God. Verse 21 reads this way, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath for as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill threescore and ten years. And God told them they would be taken into captivity through the prophet Jeremiah, but he also uh, and indicated by purchasing land that they would return. And God is faithful to his unconditional covenant to his people, the Olam forever, Abrahamic covenant. And then in addition, I'll just simply allude to the text where the disciples asked our Lord Jesus in the days of our Lord as they were standing at Herod's massive temple, which we're told probably held about 250,000 people, and Nebuchadnezzar's temple was also uh, very renowned and uh, humongous, I might say. However, Jesus said, as he pointed to them, they said, uh, how are we going to know that the end time? I'm paraphrasing, when the time uh, of the end. Jesus said, not one stone pointing to the temple. By the way, it took 46 years for Herod to renovate that. Jesus Christ said, not one stone will be standing upon another. That was fulfilled approximately 40 years after that when the Romans stormed in the, under Titus uh, and during the Vespasian reign and, uh, and overtook Jerusalem, destroying the temple and again taking the gold back to Rome. What does Tish Ba'av have to do with these two events? Both of these events, I don't know if you knew it or not, happened on Tish B'Av, the ninth of the month. And therefore, it's a very important date in the nation of Israel. Every year, they stop and mourn and pray and fast because of this destructive event, two of them, that have taken place. Now, I said all that to say this. There is speculation and suggestion that Iran is waiting for, guess when Tish B'Av is going to take place this year, August the 12th and August the 13th. We'll have to see about that. But as we get in our study of the racing down to Armageddon, we've talked about Tish B'Av and when it did happen and how it happened. And then why is this important? We've talk, described that already. So let's go further into our study how this connects with perhaps leading up events to, again, Armageddon. First of all, I want you to take the first step, God's intervention on this coalition. Secondly, you'll notice that Antichrist abomination with deception. All of this is going to take place, I believe, during the tribulation. That means the rapture of the church, the Lord is going to descend from heaven with a shout. The voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ, rise first. Those of us that are alive and remain caught up together with the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Comfort one with his words. Resurrection of the saints, the rapture of the church, and the reunion of loved ones, and the reassurance of God's promises. He's going to be with us. That's to the church. That event's going to take place before these events, but... That means it must be closer than it's ever been because we see things lining up in our world. Thirdly, we'll see Jesus Christ's revelation against the insurrection of the devil. All right? So, the edge of Armageddon. Remember now, when the Bible used the word, the battle of Armageddon, Palome is the word in Revelation 16, which means a campaign of battles leading up. And all of this is during that Daniel 9:27, 70th week, according to Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7, of the seventh week of, uh, of uh, Israel, or Jacob, 70th week of the day of Jacob's trouble. And this is significant in the life of Israel, not the church. And therefore, the church is not meant to go into the tribulation. Study your Bible, put all the pieces together on the puzzle, Old Testament, New Testament, and you'll see uh, that uh, God has a plan for Israel, God has a plan for the church. But here is a picture, I won't delay anymore because I want to go right into the subject. Here are some 
maps indicating this first point of God's intervention of this coalition. What do I mean? After the snatching away of the bride of Christ, Jesus told Paul it would happen in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, 1 Corinthians 15. And he said, I will keep you from the hour of temptation, which is to come upon the whole world. That's uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, to the church of Philadelphia, and yet to uh, the church in general. So, but moving forward, Farther from there, what will take place after the snatching away of the bride of Christ? This confirmation of this covenant will take place, which will begin the clock ticking. And you'll notice Iran is in the news. Why? Because uh, the Israelis retaliated after, I believe it was uh, a number of uh, small children were killed, 10 or 12, I can't remember exactly, but at any rate, there were a, it was a terrible, terrible thing to happen. And so Israel took out the number one uh, commander of the Hezbollah force, which would be a proxy of Iran, located. I got this map purposely right here because you'll notice uh, on this map, you'll see uh, Israel. And you see Lebanon up in the northern part. You also see Syria. Damascus will also be destroyed. According to Isaiah 17, you can see our videos on that. You see the Golden Heights down below Damascus. This is where some of the action and the artillery has been firing and bombing uh, from Lebanon. It's been going on since really October the 7th. In addition to Israel being at war with Gaza in the southern in. And so many believe there's a, uh, a really dangerous situation here, and it seems, seems inevitable to the point that even America has sent uh, ships and aircraft and military to the Middle East because of the threat and the seems like inevitable war between. Hezbollah and Israel. Now, Hezbollah is not anything like Hamas, which is in the southern part. Hezbollah is more sophisticated. They have thousands and thousands of, of uh, artillery and are supplied through not only Iran, but now Russia has already sent supplies to Iran. So the stage is being set. You got Russia, you got China, you got Iran, you got the BRICS, which also includes Brazil and India and South uh, Africa, and now Turkey has joined that. And so here is another picture depicting God's intervention with this coalition. Here would be modern-day Persia. I'm highlighting primarily Iran because that seems to be the two main enemies that are facing off, and it appears it's going to lead to an all-out war here unless something happens. So Persia is listed in Ezekiel 38.5 to be one of the nations that will join this coalition of nations that will come from the north, according to Ezekiel 38, along with Turkey, who Erdogan has already indicated he would like to attack. He was ready and would attack and obliterate Israel. Do you know another country that has been threatened so much to annihilate them besides Israel? And I'm not just talking about lately or the last few weeks. I'm talking about for years and years. But God's hand is on that nation. 1948, May the 14th, they affirmed again to be a nation. It was a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And God gave them the land. Leviticus chapter 25 says, And the Lord let God be true and every man a liar. God is going to see his word fulfilled. And no weapon that's formed against them shall prosper. Isaiah 54, 17, that's to Israel. And the Lord has said, some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we remember the name of the Lord our God. God, the God of Israel, doesn't sleep nor slumber. That's Psalm chapter 121. So you got the Gog and Magog with Russia joining this coalition uh, also, God will intervene. That's why I use the term, God's intervention. 
God's intervention on the coalition. Psalm 83 lists other nations that will be involved. Some separate these two battles. Some suggest they're the same battle. At any rate, there are other nations listed in Psalm chapter 83 as to the Ishmaelites, for example, which would be more than likely Saudi Arabia and Jabal and Tyre, which would be listed up in the Lebanon, which would probably be uh, the naming of the Hezbollah fighters along with Iran, which here is this map. In Jeremiah 49, the Lord tells us that Elam is going to, the, God's going to break the bow of Elam where there'll never be a nation. Some suggest it's never been fulfilled at this point. I'm just simply pointing out, connecting the dots here with what's going on in our world. However, you do realize that God Almighty will arise and His enemies will be scattered, as Psalm 68 verse 1 says. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of an angry God. One plus God's a majority. If God be for us, who can be against us? As said Paul in Romans 8 31. And so the Lord is going to intervene in the form of earthquake and infighting and confusion and pestilences and fire. And so uh, they're going to, he's going to break five, six of this army, five, six of this army. I believe this would be the most the common denominator, which would be Islam. That's why I do not believe the Islamic religion will take prominence in the end time as to the Antichrist. Uh, some differ from that, but anyway, so this is the coalition we're talking about, that God's going to intervene. And so that leads us not only to God's intervention on the coalition, but what about the Antichrist abomination? After and during all of this, from day one of the tribulation, after the rapture, the snatching away of the bride of Christ, as Jesus said, I am my Father's house and many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. He's talking about the Father's house. I realize it's a picture of a Jewish wedding where the bridegroom would leave and the bride would be having to watch and wait, not knowing the time or the hour her bridegroom would come back. And then through a procession at night, the announcement would be made, hold the bridegroom coming, just like our bridegroom. Christ Jesus, we are the body of Christ, we're the bride of Christ. Revelation chapter 19 describes that to be the case, and the bride goes out to meet her husband, her uh, bridegroom. We'll go up in the clouds to meet the Lord, and such a beautiful parallel picture there. However, uh, the abomination of desolation will take place. What do I mean by the abomination of desolation? Jesus Christ made reference to that in that Olivet Discourse found in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 14 and verse, excuse me, chapter 24 and verse 15. And along those signs of the time which parallel with Revelation chapter 6, the wars and rumors of wars and pestilences and earthquakes and false Christ, when the opening of the seals will begin the tribulation, white horse rider, red horse rider, black horse rider, pale horse rider, and the seven seals only to be followed by, in rapidity, seven trumpets, and where there'll be cataclysmic events with the catastrophic um, economical, the sea and the grass and, and demon forces, 200 million being unleashed out of the abyss, and yet uh, the mark of the beast being a prominent uh, note in this tribulation where the Antichrist, the abomination, will take place halfway through the tribulation. He will have this pseudo-peace plan as 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 and 2, Paul wrote after talking about the rapture in chapter 4, he said, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord will come as a thief of the night. When they shall say, peace and safety. Then sudden destruction comes upon them as travail of one with child, and they shall not escape. The point being this, Antichrist, uh, he's mentioned, and Jesus said as the Daniel the prophet mentioned the abomination of desolation. Historically speaking, Antichos Epiphanes, a uh, Syrian, did come in and defile, desecrate the temple with slaughtering a hog and put it on the altar, 167 B.C., 
and the Maccabeans ran him out of town. That was a prototype or a foreshadowing of uh, a precursor, as it were, of the Antichrist, the man of sin, that will sit in the temple of God showing himself that he is God, 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. So these are not the same, uh, these are not the same characters, the uh, Antichus Epiphanes, which is listed, by the way, in the book of Daniel chapter 11 with five personalities, number one being Hazarus, number two being the king uh, of all generals, that would be Alexander the Great, number three being Antiochus the Great, number four, Antiochus Epiphanes. All of these have already been fulfilled, and the Lord of God has uh, accurately fulfilled those in Daniel chapter 11. So the Antichrist will sit in the temple of God, and he'll cause all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and mom, to receive a mark in their right hand or the forehead, that no man might buy or sell, save he that hath the mark of the beast. That him that hath understanding, understand it's the number of man. The number is 603 score and 6. That's Revelation 13, verses 16 through 18. And yet when he leaves the temple, he'll set up this image. The image will have both the power to speak and to cause all those that do not worship the beast or his image to be uh, tormented and to uh, be judged because of no man being able to buy or sell, an economic boycott. Christ abomination and deception. All of this is leading up to, again, Armageddon. That leads us to our third uh, and final step as we race through this, this study, Tish B'Av, Tish B'Av. Uh, the third and final step after the rapture of the church and after the beginning of the tribulation and the unfolding of not only the trumpet judgment but also the bowl judgments where the kings of the east are going to emerge over uh, Revelation chapter 16 and verse 12, I believe it is, the, uh, over the Euphrates River and merge in the valley of Jezreel. And it's in Israel. And the Antichrist armies will all merge there to usurp authority over the king of kings and the lord of lords. But as we see here, this insurrection in Revelation chapter 16, Revelation chapter 19, Zechariah chapter 14, all nations are going to come against Jerusalem to battle. Zechariah 14, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and the Lord shall go forth to fight against the nations. And, and the Lord shall go forth to fight against the nations. All nations will gather to battle against Jerusalem. If America's left, that's where she's going to be fighting against Jerusalem. You can see that very well easily happening, can't you? I hope you've got a relationship with the Lord as we talk about this. I really do. I hope that you've got peace with God. You don't have to be troubled. You don't have to be afraid because God's got things in, under his control. And if we know that our home's in heaven, we have uh, a relationship with Jesus through his sacrificial death, his precious redeeming blood, and his vicarious resurrection and by receiving him as our Lord and Savior, repenting of our sins, a lady just, I was at a revival, was just gloriously saved and baptized this past Sunday. And I was rejoiced over that. But then Christ will come in Zechariah 14. He put his feet on the Mount of Olives. His Mount of Olives shall cleave in two from the east to the west, and there should be a great valley. You see here a picture of a, a artist who portrayed our Lord with the vesture dipped in blood, his name is called the Word of God, and he's got a crown, not a Stephanos crown, instead a diadem. John says this, I saw heaven open, behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he that judge and make war, his eyes are the flame of fire. On his head are many crowns, that's diadem. And he hath a vesture dipped in blood, his name is called the Word of God. And I saw the armies in heaven which followed him. That'll be the church, followed him clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. He should smite the nations, he that treads upon the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. He hath on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. What a mighty God we serve. He's not coming on the back of a donkey or an elephant. He's coming on the clouds of heaven. Hallelujah. He's going to rule and reign with a rod of iron, and he's going to implement his kingdom, and his kingdom there should be no end. Yes, Israel is the apple of his eye. Many are blinded now, but 
Zechariah chapter 2 and verse 8 describes that. He's the pupil. You touch your eye and it hurts and these nations coming against Israel. I realize that many are blinded still in Israel as Zechariah 12, 10 says, when he comes, they'll look upon him whom they pierced and mourn and Israel will be saved according to Romans chapter 11. Paul makes reference to Israel's past, present, and future. Chapter 9, 10, and 11. He's not finished with them yet. And so we need to go and tell. We need to be faithful to the finish. And I want to close on this. Tishba Ba'av. Did you know this? Did you know all of this is connected? And I don't know when and if. I don't know when and all the details, what's going to happen in the future. But I know this. I know God's word is being fulfilled. I know that you can trust him. Whereas you don't know the future and I don't know the future, but I know he holds the future. And again, things we can't control. They're out of our control. We can put our faith in God to control what we can't control and to know that uh, our eternal destiny is in heaven where we'll be with Jesus forever and ever and ever. In addition, God gives us his grace and great love and forgiveness of our sin here, this side of heaven, to be a witness, to be a trophy of his grace, to be an instrument to spread the good news in a bad news world. Go and tell. Go and tell. Let somebody know that uh, God's saved you, that he's forgiven your sin, you got a new heart, and that you got a new life. I'm not like I used to be. I've my want-tos have changed. I'm not what I ought to be, but I thank God I'm not what I used to be. And I want you to go and tell. I want you to please do something for me. I, ever, I very seldom ever ask you to share this video, this message with someone else. That's the purpose of why we do these uh, messages is to get the Word of God out. There's many that need a relationship with Jesus. There's many that are, are living in fear and don't have answers. And so... Getting a biblical worldview is extremely important. This is our goal at until that day. So thank you for joining us. God bless you. And if you're a Christian, I want to tell you, hold fast that which you have until he comes. If you're not a Christian, that's your greatest pressing need. I would not reject Jesus and die and go out in eternity lost to a place called hell. Instead, I would run to Jesus and say, <laughs> forgive me of my sin because it's appointed that a man wants to die, but after this, the judgment. Let's pray together. And I want to thank you again for joining us. Father, I ask you to bless those witnesses and, and our churches and preachers and teachers and Christians, oh God, that are holding the line. And we see things going on all around us and uh, it's shouldn't be surprising, although we're often just caught off guard. It just seems like events are happening every day. And your word has told us where things are heading. And I pray for great peace. You said great peace have they which love thy law and nothing shall offend them. So give us your peace and your victory to flesh out Holy Spirit your life that others will see you and that we would point people to you until you come back again. So we thank you now for the lives that are being changed now. We give you praise and glory. You're worthy of it. Even so come, Lord Jesus. In your name, Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. God bless you and thank you for joining us. And God be with you till we meet again. Thank you.